welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, here with my good buddy, John Matola, coming all the way from the Deep Purple Podcast. He's been on the show so many times. I've been on their show. It's uh, We might as well just merge these all into one show. What do you think, John? I don't know. I think that I'm like, uh, I think I have some competition now. I think Rich has taken over uh, my spot as the uh, <laughs> the number one guest that's <laughs> that's been on here and... Uh, like yeah. I was just saying before we recorded that it, I feel like we've been talking this whole time because you and Rich's episode has been so long. I just feel like I'm sitting in on the conversation with you guys, but not contributing. <laughs> and, and as we record this, there's still one more episode yet to oh come out. Because so, <laughs> like, I just I just accepted the fact that this is probably just going to go on forever. So now I just think it's like the <laughs> the the Scott and Rich show at this point, though. I think Rich and I should just start a podcast called Everything and yes. just like randomly pick subjects and just they go on however long they go on. I would listen. I appreciate that. I mean, I I mean, I told you guys before and I told I tell Rich when I hang out with them, this is just like I really enjoy listening to you guys talk. And I mean, the Beatles, the subject, the the focus subject of your episodes where you uh, is something I'm not typically interested in because I'm not a not a huge Beatles fan. Um, but when you guys start talking, we, we naturally, you know, you guys and all of us, we all go off on these tangents and when you yeah. guys go off on tangents and it's, it's just like you two specifically, the way you interact, it's just, it's so interesting. And then like, I think I was in the last episode, you started, you started talking about mega death and then you're like, all right, we got to get back to the Beatles. <laughs> and that's when uh, you guys were just like, oh, John's going to love this. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, that's, that's the thing is that uh, conversations just because I when you're doing an album review, you kind of have an outline because you've got the song list. Right. So you've got some mm -hmm. sort of order to follow uh, when I do interviews and stuff. It's just if if I have a guest on that a publicist brings to me, then, yeah, we're going to talk about whatever you're there to promote. But we're also just going to talk about whatever we talk about, wherever the conversation naturally goes. We'll get those points in. But, you know, I, I'm not one of those people that's like, okay, here's the 10 questions I have to ask my guests that they've been asked by 20 other interviewers. And, you right. know, I, I just, I think you just, you find out more that way. You dig into things that people don't get to dig into. Or in the case of me and Rich, you just talk about Megadeth in the middle of a Beatles podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I appreciate it evolved, that. Though. It, it evolved naturally, though. That's the thing. Yeah. It's just like, you didn't just stay, be like, Oh, hey, I feel like talking about Metallica and Megadeth. It's like mm -hmm. you guys just like went off on one point, which made you think, sparked you thinking about something else and then something else and down yeah. the rabbit hole you went. Speaking of uh, Metallica really quick, there was a uh, a post that, uh, so I, I follow uh, Mia Sano and Tina Guo on social media. Tina's a, a metal cellist and uh, she plays, she does the Hans Zimmer tours. Uh, she wrote the Wonder Woman theme with Hans Zimmer. And then Mia Sano is like a metal violinist. And then they have a friend who plays metal bagpipes. And I guess the bagpipe player had written or had posted something and somebody, oh, it was like a, they were playing along to Metallica or something. Yeah. And somebody wrote in and said that James wouldn't approve. And then Metallica responded and said, uh, he doesn't speak for us. You're awesome. I thought, how how cool would that be yeah. to have like, you know, your heroes or some band that you really like just jump in and support you like that? Yeah, that is cool. That'd be pretty. And I mean, I mean, that's really out of pocket, too. I mean, that's like not a, just a regular cover band. So mm -hmm. yeah. uh, something very, uh, very unique. So mm -hmm. that's um, I, I feel like a lot of people are are doing that these days, trying to put their uh, unique spin on things. And uh, it's. Yeah, some of it's like, and you know, some of it's worth getting attention. Yeah, worthy but of attention. It's so it. easy to get licensed now. You know, you can you can pay a service twelve bucks, and they'll do all the work, and then they just take part of the cut from whatever you make off of it. And uh, it's it's a lot different now than it used to be. Before, you had to hire a lawyer, and you had to get them involved, and it cost you a lot to do a cover song. Yeah. So yeah, but not anymore, right? Well, not at all. Mm. Uh, Deep Rebel Podcast is kicking ass. You guys uh, just, as we're recording this, recently covered uh, the first part of a David Coverdale solo album that I never heard before. And uh, too. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I, um, I was, um, uh, that that episode was uh, was fun to record because as you know, we love us some Coverdale. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I'd never heard uh, Into the Light before. And uh, like I said on the episode, 
one look at the album cover and I was just like, ah, oh, Coverdale's gone new age or something. Forget <laughs> it. The haircut, and I was, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't interested. But I mean, uh, just like with the rest of these albums, once you start digging into it, looking like really looking at the the album artwork, really looking at the people that were involved, really starting to listen to the music uh, based on all of the the past, his past with White Snake, his original solo albums, then you start to kind of piece it together and be like, oh, this isn't that bad. And even though it wasn't our most highly rated album, um, I enjoyed a lot of it more than I thought I would. It was, I think the comment that I made throughout the episode, if I could remember, is it just like, all right, I wasn't expecting this, or this is something right. that I wasn't expecting. And um, in a good way, because it's, um, um, I felt that Coverdale was able to be more experimental and do less white snake sounding stuff because he put it, he was finally able to put it under his name. Right. And that's, I think that that's something that a artist can do like uh, for a, uh, when they do a solo project, if they're in a well-known band is if they do something that's really off the wall or using different sounds or different melodies or vocal techniques or anything that they don't usually do, it's not as weird because it's not like, you, you know, you can't be like, well, this isn't this doesn't sound like white snake and point to the album cover and be like well nobody claimed it was white snake this <laughs> right. is coverdale well i think i think too uh, another really good example of that would be when ian gillen and roger glover did accidentally on purpose because it was very yeah. synth oriented very yeah. programmed music uh something that you would never have heard in deep purple yeah and i mean i think even back then i was maybe not able to articulate it like this but i remember thinking that is, is like first of all that it was so cool that gillen and glover had an album together but then when i put it on and i heard the opening keyboard to clouds and rain and i was like okay what is this um <laughs> right. but i wasn't but i wasn't exactly surprised you know what I mean? Like, uh, but um, I was like, OK, this doesn't sound like Deep Purple. But at the same time, I, I like I kind of knew like, OK, they, this is two guys from Deep Purple. So it made kind of sense that they were doing something a little off the wall, a little different. Right. Um, and even back then, uh, I mean, and, um, I, I started off really loving, loving heavier music. And then as I grew older, got to appreciate all different types, like especially that that kind of like uh, poppier type of music. But even back then, there were little bits and pieces that I liked. And I think just Gillen and Glover were so great in purple together individually that something drew me to that album, even back then when I was younger, uh, mm -hmm. first listening to it. And it was like, I guess you could say a guilty pleasure. You know, you some of those bands you listen to and you don't want to admit <laughs> you don't want right. to admit that yeah. you like them uh, because you're just like, well, I'm the metal guy. I'm not going to. I'm not going to admit that I I like listening to uh, George Michael. <laughs> yeah, because ba back then it was so much about the image. And I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. for me, I felt very isolated in in, uh, in you know high school because there wasn't anybody talking about Deep Purple. It was all Metallica and Megadeth and, you know, the more heavier metal stuff. And, and I was like, hey, do you guys like Deep Purple? Okay, I'll be over here. <laughs> well i mean that's um i mean and that just goes to like how uh how nate and i met each other and and got to be friends is because like we liked those heavier bands like i mean if you if you like if saw nate back in the day he was like the the reincarnation of cliff burton you know like just mm -hmm. the, the straight long hair little mustache and everything you know always wearing band t-shirts and everything but it's like this this you know this kid was who looked like a total metal guy was like totally and like bought into the whole deep purple thing which is like who knew right right and um and that's how we became friends it's just a love for this you know music that was you know at the time like what 20 20 years old and they were just like ah they're ancient you know <laughs> it's like well, and, and what's even more amazing is when you find out that a lot of the bands that you were listening to were influenced by deep purple I mean, you look yeah. at Iron Maiden, you look at Metallica. I mean, Metallica was hugely influenced by Deep Purple. And yeah, uh, I never it's, knew. it's really interesting once you find out the roots of all those things. It was kind of like for me, um, Jesus Christ Superstar, the movie mm -hmm. was a huge thing in, in my family. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until years after I started listening to Deep Purple that I even found out that Ian was on the original broadcast recording. I never knew that that even existed for the longest yeah. time, you know? Yeah, me too. I had to, I, you know, in past episodes of our podcast have explained like how I came to find it out, but that was 
before the days of social media. So just yeah. reading about it and trying to seek it out and trying to figure out, like, I didn't know was, was Gillen in the movie, which character was he? I was, so, I mean, I was like yeah. buying everything up and by extension, I got into the movie thinking that Gillen was in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, but I mean, I mean, I don't know, maybe I would have gotten into it anyways. Um, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, I didn't realize, uh, until we started the show, like you were just saying, how many bands were influenced by Deep Purple, Metallica, um, Van, Van Halen. Like, yeah. like when we got into that, I was like, I had no idea. And I mean, I'm not a huge, a casual Van Halen fan, right? Mm -hmm. Like no idea that they were even remotely like Iron Maiden. Like, I mean, all these just just picking bands from everywhere, just not even knowing that they were an influence. And um, it, it's just it was it's shocking to find out the, um, you know, the the reach of all these like um, very um, just diverse you know, uh, kind of uh, musical styles, like, you know, in the metal world. Right. Because it's like uh, Metallica and Iron Maiden and Van Halen is three examples all all under the same umbrella of music, right. but all really different uh, styles. I have to wonder about bands like Poison, though. I mean, it would seem like it wouldn't be a shock if Brett Michaels was a big fan of Deep Purple. But at the same point, they're so far apart. You just don't equate them as being a, you know, in, having that influence. Yeah, I, th I think we talked about that before when we did our Poison episode. Was, I think we did. Like, what, like, who do we think it influenced them? And it's like, and, and again, I was a huge Poison fan when I was a kid. They were like one mm -hmm. of the first bands I was into because I love that L.A. metal glam scene but when you think about it i have to stop and really think like did they ever talk about who their influences are because when you like i don't see like for instance deep purple in those guys right or in like a motley crew or in guns and roses whereas it's like you could easily say like kiss aerosmith you know i i know for a fact that those are those bands have mentioned them but outside of that like any anything further or anything more like i don't i wouldn't know off the top of my head but yet you could look at Metallica and you could say, OK, some of their riffs are pretty intricate. You know, you look at like the riff for Master of Puppets is, is not a very simple, repetitive thing, like, say, uh, Paranoid, whereas Paranoid is just a very simple riff. But then right. you look at like, you know, Smoke in the Water is a little more intense and a lot of Deep Purple's riffs are actually pretty long. And so you could kind of start to see a little bit of that in Metallica. They also do a lot of those. Um, oh, I can't think of the word on guitar now that Richie does. Um not triplets. Um, oh, it'll come to me at some point. But there's there's a lot of those uh, trills. There's a lot of trills that they use, which Richie does. I mean, you can when you once you know it, you could kind of start to see it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, the podcast is doing great. As um, uh, Nate and I are doing what we're calling our light and breezy summer format. <laughs> uh, I'm which loving is, that. Uh, which is uh, basically is uh, we're trying to record intentionally shorter episodes uh, for for ourselves and for the listeners. Um, so we're not uh, because, I mean, we all have our summer plans. Uh, he's he's got stuff that he's doing with his his family and his kids because they're out of school. And, you know, he's always on the move doing something. And I have uh, vacation time coming up and uh, family visiting. So it's. um you know, we're like, okay, we still need to get it in. We got to, we haven't missed an episode. So we got to make sure that we, uh, we bank some and do them, but we want to make sure that we're not uh, taking a lot of time doing it. So um, I think we banged out a couple that were like maybe about an hour. Um, and it's good for the, for the uh, listeners too, because yeah. in the summer, a lot of people, same thing, they're on the move and maybe they don't want to listen to a two hour episode. Um, I so, do, but whatever. <laughs> well, I said most people, not not Scott well, Haskins. <laughs> spe speaking of Nate, I, I should have had the postcard. It's it's over in the corner, but uh, Nate sent me a postcard from his trip to his recent trip to Toronto, yep. and it was of the uh, Canadian National Tower, the CN Tower, the the big uh, you know stick that stands out out there. And uh, I sent him back pictures from when I was there. I was there uh, when I was a kid. We yep. took a trip from Detroit to Toronto for a few days and went to the Science Center out there, went up in the, uh, we went up to the observation deck. We didn't eat at the restaurant uh, like Nate did, but I think the most fun I had was down in the basement where all the maple sugar candy was and they had an arcade down there and like a Lego replica of the CN Tower. Really cool place. Yeah, yeah. He sent me, uh, I think he sent me a similar postcard too. 
I got to up my game because like I'm getting postcards now from like, I think all of you, I've gotten postcards from like you, Rich, Nate, Roback, um, Gardo. And I don't think I've sent a damn postcard. <laughs> so I got to get on that. You sent me a white snake patch though, which is very cool. That's right. I did. So, I did send, I did send gifts. I'm not as, you know, I do everything else. Do everything yeah. electronically. So yeah, pretty much the same way. I don't I don't have access to postcards anymore because now that I'm not driving, yeah. um, there's nowhere to get them. Yeah. So well, yeah, I'm gonna have to uh I'm gonna like I said, I'm gonna have to get on top of that because I will be uh we'll be going a couple of places this summer. So maybe you guys will get something with a moose on it or something. I'll I but... can handle that. Well, before <laughs> we start on our topic, speaking of going places, John, we're actually gonna meet in person. For the first oh time God. in history in August. Yeah. I'm excited. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I'm excited too. All of us, like uh, you, you, me, um, Rich, and Nate. Mm -hmm. We're, We're all meeting before. up in Detroit to go see Deep Purple and then heading to Chicago to go see Deep Purple again. Because yep. I don't care how good the first concert is, it's not going to be enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, we we did that before. I think uh, the um, la was it last year? It feels like an eternity ago mm -hmm. um, at this point, you know, but I think it was. Uh, yeah. Last year we did the same thing. And um, um, uh, what was it? Um, New, um, uh, Philly. Uh, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, jo uh, where the hell was it in New Jersey? It Somewhere in New Jersey. Oh, Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. Jersey. Well, yeah. And, but and, like and you had seen shows, them back yeah. to back uh, in Florida, right? When you went down to the casino there, but you didn't have to go anywhere else because they were playing the same venue, right? Um, no, no, they um, actually no. We did um, we did the same thing. We saw them at the casino, and then we saw them at um, in um, uh, uh, was it Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale or uh, oh. Hollywood? And then oh, we Hollywood, drove, yeah, yeah. And then we drove out to um, um, oh man. I remember the name of the theater of another St. Pete's and uh, the Mahaffey Theater. So we saw them like in two very different uh, venues, but again, back to back. So I guess, yeah. So I guess doing like back to back Deep Purple shows has kind of become a tradition for us. I guess so. Well, uh, this is the first one I'm doing and I'm looking very, very forward to it. I'm, I don't know what I'm looking forward to most, like seeing the band again, which is very important, meeting up with you guys, because that's just going to be fun and kind of surreal, going yeah. back to my hometown. Like there's so many things happening in those couple of days for me. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to come home and go, what the hell just happened? I think it's all about the experience. Um, uh, I like to, uh, you know, I'll give Rich credit for, he coined the uh, phrase, it's all about the hang. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I, I, and I, you know, and I think that that's, uh, that's true. Like he said that, and another quote that I like is from uh, Gardot uh, when we were, I think it was when we were seeing Glenn Hughes and we were up here in Worcester. And a couple of times he just stopped and looked around and was just like, this is like a family reunion with a big smile on his face. Yeah. And um, it's like those two sentiments always like enter my mind when these things happen, because it's like, yeah, seeing seeing the band, of course, is great. But mm -hmm. that's that's really a short part of the experience. The larger part is like what you're saying is like you're going and you're going to be seeing your hometown, you're going to be hanging around. We're all going to be hanging around together, like mm -hmm. eating, drinking, like, you know, going places after the show, talking about the show, hopefully meeting other people uh, mm -hmm. that listen to the show or that we just maybe get strike up conversations with it. So, so it's really all about the experience and yeah. uh, that's what really makes it fun. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's almost like uh, the show is an excuse <laughs> to, uh, to right. get together and, and have that fun. Exactly. Um, yeah. I kind of, I always just figured it would be here because this is the most accessible place for lodging and, you know, everything else. But uh, I'll go back. I'll, I'll get on a plane. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a shame. I would love to meet uh, Peter and, and, uh, you know, Mark, and uh, hopefully we'll get to do that at some point. Peter, of course, is responsible for the uh, insane vinyl package that I got in the mail that I did my unboxing video on, on unfortunately 36 hours of no sleep. And I just, I promised him I would do an unboxing video and I just could not go to bed and not know what was in that package. I'm like, well, if I open it, I have to do the video. And I couldn't even read. Like I, I was so tired at that point. I couldn't even yeah. read his notes or anything. I had to do that the next day after I'd gotten some sleep. But uh, thanks again, Peter. That was an, an incredible package of albums. Mm. I'm looking forward to digging into here when I have some time. Uh, but 
We are here getting ready for the final season of Cobra Kai, Netflix's offshoot. Well, it started on YouTube and yeah. then Netflix picked it up. I, I can't believe that YouTube was going to let that go. I mean, seriously, that just yeah. blows my mind. You know, it's a yeah. huge success. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I don't know. I don't. Do you know any of the kind of uh, reasoning behind that? Because I know it started on um, which I don't even know if it still exists on YouTube Red. I don't think it, I think YouTube Red has morphed into whatever their new subscription service is. Yeah. I think, honestly, I think they just didn't promote it that well. Yeah. Um, because I don't, as far as the writing, the performances, the quality of the video, I don't see any difference from season one to season five or six. I, I don't see there being anything that really changed other than where it was showing. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously there's been a lot of, um, uh development into the uh the characters the story i mean they must have uh, really had a far reach to just bring back all of the all like all, pretty much all of the original actors mm -hmm. actresses from the you know original movies to to just really give it that that really special feeling even when it's like uh people from the third one which is uh the third movie mm -hmm. which is kind of like eh, but it was like impressive that they were like two characters that they brought back even from that right uh from that movie but um but yeah no i haven't seen uh really uh, i mean i've seen the the uh the change from like season one to season uh five um uh which obviously shows naturally evolve and change and stuff like that but um yeah, I mean, the, the quality of that first season, like I said, when I um uh, I subscribed to YouTube TV and at the time they were just like, well, if you get YouTube TV, then you automatically get YouTube Red. And I'm like, all right, I don't know what that is, but at least I get to watch the <laughs> series because I thought what a cool concept. Right. Ah. And um, man, when I tell you that was um, I said this in our other Cobra Kai episodes, I was so impressed by just the. Um, and, and you know what? It's not even the quality because, I mean, all, all shows can have a, a quality of of picture and sets mm -hmm. and, you know, lighting and everything. But just like the the I think the passion that went into it, um, because, um, like I said, I haven't done any um, any kind of reading or research behind like really who did it. But you have to think that the people that were involved, not just the actors, but like the writers or producers, everything were really passionate about the original movies and the legacy and the characters to have it done so well and it's such like a nostalgia thing for people of our age to see it and just see like you know have the story develop and have it be like sad and funny and serious and and like intense and just all these things at once and 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 have you care about the legacy characters as well as the new characters and and even be able to laugh at itself. Like there are some parts that are cheesy, but it's not like badly done. You just kind of roll yeah. your eyes and be like, oh, oh, Johnny. Oh, Johnny. You know? yeah. I was going to say that's <laughs> you know? where it usually is. Yeah. You know, you know you're just it, like. It, it is a roller coaster, this show. And that's one thing I really love about it is mm -hmm. that you really, you can't rest. You know, anytime these kids think that they get a breather, there's another yeah. thing coming around the corner and you just don't know what it is. And you think, OK, yeah. finally, they're going to be able to enjoy themselves. From nope. Yeah. And I love that kind of writing. It, it reminds me that intensity is uh, it reminds me of shows like Oz or The Shield or Sons of Anarchy, where they're just it's just a constant barrage of yeah. issues. Yeah, you're always um, you're always on the edge of your seat being being like, OK, this this relationship has resolved. This storyline has evolved, but there's got to be somebody, someone or something in the corner ready to come out and disrupt it. It's like just when you think everything's great, here mm -hmm. comes Crease. And then when that's resolved, you're just like, uh oh, here comes Terry Silver out of the shadows. It's just right. like it, it, like oh, you can't rest. And after that's all done, you're like, oh, here comes this um whatever her name was from the sakai takai sakai mm -hmm. um that um the uh the the woman instructor i can't remember her oh, name oh man she which is, is like she's brand, something else a brand new character is just like more evil like you even like mm -hmm. be like wow do you think like if if terry went soft would she start whooping his ass like so it's like now they're even like in, inventing new people to bring out of the woodwork. I, I think the one gaffe that they made though was just setting up the Mike Barnes thing because mm -hmm. it's like um in in the last season because you're just like oh shit the bad boy of karate but he's just like no nah, man I'm just trying to live my life just like the rest of us he'd be yeah. like 
he'd be like my karate rival from high school. Like, what do you, what's your problem, man? <laughs> like, that's how I think that's how like the real life would work. But, yeah. um, but, yeah. um, it, but anyways, it was, it was yeah. a bit of a stretch. I think the way that they brought him back in, I mean, it was, it was really cool to have him be integrated into, and not just at the beginning to like have him come back and be a part of the finale of the last season. Uh, I really dug that, but it, it did feel a little bit forced. Yeah, I mean, I think by that point um, it was, but you have to think too that um, I think it's generally accepted in um, fans of the movie that the first two, I mean, the first one is iconic. The second one, like right up there. By the time you get to the third one and then everything after that, you're just kind of like, hmm. Like, I mean, yeah. the third one was just, I think that's the the same way as like when they introduced um, um, Barnes and, and Terry in the third, I mean, they they developed the Terry Silver character like like marvelously. He's just like so cartoonish, cartoon evil, yeah. That it's like wow. But then the Mike characters is just like okay, this is kind of like the new generation Johnny, you know, just like nothing new here. It's just some other asshole that wants to beat up Daniel. <laughs> so when they brought him back, I mean, he really. I don't know. There wasn't really anything charismatic or special about his character. Originally, he was just some kind of pawn, just kind of like, um, um, like the, uh, w which Rocky movie was that? The, the one with the, uh, if you see it familiar with the, the oh, later very, Rocky yeah. movies mm -hmm. and the, the Tommy gun character. Oh, Rocky. It's five, like by yeah. the time mm -hmm. he was there, it's just like, okay. He's like, you know, you had like Apollo and you had Clubber Lang and the uh, Drago and everything. Now you got this guy. And it's like, at this point, you're just like, yeah, you know, it's just like, just, just some other asshole that like, you know, you have a, another bigger evil character, like controlling them. So the character themselves isn't really interesting. Well, and Rocky you know? became kind of a formula too. It was like every movie, somebody died and there was a new guy to fight. And then the next movie, somebody died and there was a new guy to fight. It, it like yeah. became this pattern. But the interesting thing is that no one ever got a second chance at Rocky. Like you think of Mr. T's character, right? And he's yeah. trained his whole life to be the heavyweight champion. Is he going to lose that title and never try for it again? <laughs> I mean, maybe for the convenience of this, the story, but that's yeah. about it. Right, but in real life, there's no way that isn't a lifelong rivalry that just goes back and forth. Right, right. You know? But I mean, that wouldn't, you know, would that really be as interesting for the movie going public. No, of course not. Right. But let's let's talk about the way they brought Silver back because not not the gorilla. <laughs> Terry Silver back into the <laughs> storyline. Um, because they I thought they did this so brilliantly. He was a completely different guy. His life has changed. He's not at all interested. He doesn't he didn't follow karate, even though that was his whole life before. I mean, it really took Crease to get into his head to even bring him back. And even when he did, he was very resistant. He was like, you're doing this wrong. We don't want to go back and fall into the old patterns. And he did that for a long time until he twisted. But I thought that was such a great and smooth transition. I thought they played that brilliantly. I think it was because that was, that was in, in, in Terry's character the whole time. Like he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have flipped if, if that wasn't there inside of him the whole time, like I was convinced that he was, he was trying to change. He was trying to become another person. And like, it was do that whole thing, what he turned into was dormant and all he needed was somebody to come and and wake it up. Like, and that was, that was crease. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I don't think that, um, I don't think that he was not an evil guy or that he really wanted to change. I think he was always that way. He was just kind of, like I said, it just kind of he his focus shifted mm -hmm. and he probably wasn't a nice guy anyways, because I mean, all of the all of the stuff that he had, uh, the riches that he accumulated, I'm sure he was a shady businessman. Oh, yeah. Um, well, so dumping he was, the toxic waste and all that. You, you yeah. Know, so kinda, I'm sure he was. Yeah, nice. he was he was evil in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure that he wasn't a nice guy. I'm sure he didn't acquire all of that, like ethically or by being a great guy, because I mean, even uh, uh, later on, like um, him. Uh, him framing crease or um him like uh, uh in the last season um going to um like the the confession uh, who was it um uh, stingray confessing 
yeah. and everybody and them having the video evidence and then him like uh, presumably being taken away. You're thinking, OK, he's 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 got some judge or somebody in his pocket where he'll probably be out in season six. Like you don't have all that before you turn evil again without already doing some shady and like unethical stuff. So I don't think he was ever truly not evil. I would agree with that. I think his life just shifted away from the kinds of things that would lead him to that. Like he said, yeah. he'd been to therapy. He started doing meditation. He'd become much more, you know, Zen. And, and he got away from that lifestyle because maybe he found a way he didn't have to be that way. Yeah. But at the same point, it's like, I think it really just begs the question, can people really change from their actual self? Well, I would, I would equate it to like, um, to being to being like uh addicted to say like being uh having an addiction right mm -hmm. is is like he was fine as long as that influence like the the lure of karate or cobra kai like taking over the world wasn't uh or that style of karate or like the really what it is is just like um having power and influence over people and um as long as that wasn't dangled in front of him like like drugs or alcohol or whatever to an right, addict right as yeah. long as you stay away from it and resist it you're fine but as soon as like you get a little sniff of it you go on a bender and i think that's what happened to him i think that's that's exactly right exactly right <laughs>